This week we start Unit 3 of the course, and it's called Christ in All Scripture. And I guess one of the questions on your mind at first may be, what does that mean, Christ in All Scripture? Well, we're going to learn how every passage in the Bible points to Jesus in one way or another. We interpret every passage that way because that's how Jesus interpreted the Bible. I want to take you to a verse in Luke chapter 24. You remember this story where Jesus has risen from the grave, and two disciples are walking along the road to Emmaus, and Jesus joins them. They don't recognize him at first, and he travels along with them, and he, they start telling him what's been going on in Jerusalem, that Jesus has been crucified, and people are disappointed because they thought he was the Messiah, and they don't yet recognize that this person they're walking with is Jesus. And then here's what it says in Luke 24, 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus started speaking with these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he showed them how all of the scriptures, that is, all of the Old Testament, pointed to him. And you may remember the end of the story. When they get near the village where they're going, it says, He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opened to us the scriptures? So Jesus showed them how the entire Old Testament points to him. And then when they realized it was Jesus, they said essentially we should have known it was Jesus because the way he taught us the scriptures made our hearts burn. It gave us spiritual excitement and it resonated as true. And that's how we want our teaching and preaching of the scriptures to be whenever we're leading other people to know Jesus through this Bible. We want to point them to Jesus through every passage and every verse we go to so that even if they're reading Old Testament laws, when they're finished listening to our teaching, they'll say, our hearts burned within us and we were spiritually excited to follow Jesus because of that teaching. Well, then that leads us to the question, what does it mean to find Christ in every passage of Scripture? Let me begin by telling you what it does not mean to find Christ in every passage of Scripture. It does not mean that there's hidden symbolism in every passage that represents Jesus. The classic example of this uh, was first posed by a man named Clement of Rome, who lived around the year A.D. 100. And he proposed that in Joshua chapter 2, and then in, um, I think it's Joshua chapter 6, where the Israelites circle Jericho and then the walls collapse and they go in. You remember that the spies went in and Rahab hid them and they told her, put a scarlet cord in your window when we come back and we'll see the scarlet cord and we'll know it's you and you'll be saved. We won't destroy you or anybody in your household, but the whole rest of the city we're going to destroy. And Clement of Rome posed that the scarlet cord in Joshua represents the blood of Christ. And just as Rahab was saved because she hung the scarlet cord out her window, those who display the blood of Christ as, uh, as having, having been spilled for them will gain salvation. Well, it's a neat little, little parallel, but the problem is there's nothing in Joshua that suggests to us that that's the meaning of the text. It's just arbitrary symbolism that's supposed to stand for Christ. And people have done this throughout church history. They've taken passages of Scripture and then decided what aspects of the story represent Jesus in what way. And it's arbitrary. It's not in keeping with the text. So making every passage into a secret allegory about Christ is not what I mean when I say that Christ is in every passage of Scripture. I also don't mean that every passage is a prophetic prediction of Jesus. There are some passages that are prophetic predictions of Jesus. I think of Isaiah 53 that has so many specific predictions about the suffering servant and other predictions all throughout the Old Testament going back even to Genesis chapter 3. But the vast majority of texts in the Bible 
are not straightforward predictions of Jesus. So that's not what I mean either when I talk about every passage in the Bible points to Christ. Well, what does it mean that every passage in the Bible points to Christ? It means that every passage fits into the Bible's overarching storyline, which is about Jesus. We've not finished studying a passage until we know where it fits in the big story of the Bible and how that section of the scripture relates to Jesus. In fact, our understanding of a passage is incomplete if we merely apply the rules of interpretation that we learned in Stein and then don't go any further. We should always apply the rules of interpretation, but if you just know the genre of the passage, if you just know the original audience that it was written to and the figures of speech in it and that kind of thing, you still are left with a whole lot of questions. For example, think about Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. I was about to turn to it, but I suspect we all know it. It's remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It's the fourth commandment. Think about the rules that we've learned from Stein thus far. They really help us go a long way to understanding that passage. We understand that it's an Old Testament law. It's part of a covenant. And you know even that that, uh, that covenant is like an ancient Near Eastern suzerainty covenant. It's between a lord and a vassal. God is unilaterally setting the terms of the covenant and giving them to his people Israel. And he's telling them that if you obey these laws, if you obey in particular this Sabbath law, then you will be blessed. If you disobey it, you will be cursed. We understand those things, and obeying it brings fellowship with God. Disobeying it brings disfellowship with God. And under this law, Israel was to set aside every Sabbath, that is, every Saturday, to worship the Lord and not to work in the same way that they did on other days. Well, there you go. I've just applied the rules of interpretation, but we're still left with the big question, what does this passage have to do with us today? And how does it relate to the New Testament? Well, when you understand the Bible's overarching storyline, then you begin to get a better idea of how to get a handle on this text and how it relates to us. The Bible's overall story is that in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sinned. And by their sin, they ruined the perfect harmony of creation and introduced every bad thing that has come pain and suffering and death uh, and every other bad thing you can think of in this world, every unpleasant thing is a result of the fall. It's a result of Adam and Eve sinning and marring God's perfect creation and then incurring a curse from the Lord. And after Genesis 3, the story of the Bible is how God was working to fix all the damage done by sin. It's a story that carries all the way through the New Testament where Jesus is the one who comes to give the ultimate fix. And he starts giving that fix now in this church era, and then when he comes again, he's going to give the full and final fix to the problem of sin and all the difficulty it's created in the world. Well, at the phase in God's plan where he gave that fourth commandment, God had chosen Israel to be his special people, and he was beginning to reverse the curse of sin among the Israelites, and he was using them to extend his blessings to other nations. It was a unique period in time where God made special rules and had a special covenant with national Israel. When Jesus came, he established a new covenant, and it superseded the covenant that he made with national Israel so that some of those laws that God gave to Israel passed away, and he gave new standards. Uh, I think specifically of when Peter saw the, in Acts, Peter saw the sheet of unclean meats coming down from heaven and God told him, take and eat. In other words, under this new covenant, the old laws aren't all the same. I'm making some changes. But there was still continuity because God was working the same plan to reverse the effects of sin. There was just a new phase. So when we get to the New Testament and the new covenant, we understand that God made some changes in this commandment to keep the Sabbath. Christians began to worship on Sundays rather than Saturdays. And by that repeated practice in Acts, and even mention of it in the rest of the New Testament, we get the impression that God endorsed that. So the command was changed from worshiping on Saturday to worshiping on Sunday. 
And under the new covenant, God changed the way that his people were to worship. No longer were they to offer certain sacrifices. But Jesus had made the once for all sacrifice. And his people were to simply revel in that sacrifice and trust in it for their salvation. So then we, when we see the Bible's overall story, we start to get an idea of how to interpret Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. There's still a principle in play, and that is take one day out of seven to rest from your work and to worship God. But the day on which we worship and the way in which we worship have shifted from the time that God first gave that law to Moses. You wouldn't understand any of that unless you had an idea of the overall story of the Bible and what God was doing throughout the history of his people. Well, we'll come back to that Exodus 20 passage, but I think you start to get the idea of what I'm saying. With any passage, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, you have not finished your job of interpreting it and applying it until you understand where it fits into the overall story of the Bible. And that's where Bible meshes, the biblical story, comes in. Uh, maybe by the time you watch this lecture, you'll have had a chance to click around on the biblical story and get a feel for it. Uh, it will teach you the Bible's overall story. And the particular section of that course that we're using will walk you through 14 key passages in the Bible and show you how each of those passages fits into the big story and how each of them points to Jesus. And I hope that by studying those 14 passages, then you'll have 14 examples of how to interpret a passage in light of Christ. And I hope that those passages will help you interpret every other passage that you face. When we get to the final exam, I'm going to ask, give you some of those passages from the biblical story and ask you to then tell me how they fit into the Bible's overall story and how they point to Jesus. But we'll talk about that more later. Let me give you a, a, a brief summary of what the biblical story is. The biblical story divides up the Bible into seven eras. You'll see those eras as you click around. And for each era, there's an overview video that has teaching by Tim Keller, and it has narration by John Rhys Davies, who some of you may recognize as Gimli from the Lord of the Rings trilogy. He gives a real good narration, and it simply tells you the story of the Bible, with Tim Keller then telling you the theological significance of that. After you watch the overview video for each era, there are a series of one-page articles. We're going to do the 14-session leader guide, which is an abbreviated version of the biblical story course. If you were to do the whole biblical story course, there would be 36 lessons with uh, four, five, six articles each that you would have to read. I do know that uh, other union courses, Old Testament and New Testament survey courses, have used the biblical story as their text. So if you take Old Testament or New Testament survey within the next year, you may be able to use this same biblical story subscription for that class and not have to pay any more money for books. So that's just a tip to, to be aware of as you're planning your other union courses. But the 14 lesson plan that we're following in this class was designed to be used in a small group Bible study, but I think it works for individual use in this class just as well. And what I'd like you to do is just read through each of those leader guides, and every time it gives you a link to an article, read the article. Every time it tells you to watch one of the era videos, click the link and watch the videos. And by the time you work through all 14 of those leader guides, you will have watched seven videos that give you the summary story of the Bible. You will have read a collection of articles on the Bible's key topics and people and ideas. And I hope you will have a much better feel than you had before you started of what this whole Bible is about and how it's not just a collection of diverse books here and there, but one God inspired this one book and it has one story. That's really one of the remarkable things about the Bible, that even though there were dozens of authors and even though it was written over a couple of thousand years almost, it's still a unified book that connects with, where all the parts connect. If you have any questions about the biblical story or what you're supposed to do, you're 
always free to email me or call me and I'll give you more explanation. I just wanted to give you a thumbnail sketch on this lecture so you don't feel overwhelmed by the biblical story. You can link to your assignments from our Moodle course page or if you just want to log directly into Bible Mesh, go to story.biblemesh.com, put your username and your password, and then when you go log into the biblical story, you'll see some tabs at the top of the page. Click on Guides, and then toward the top of the page, you'll see 14 Session Leader Guide. Click on that for week six. You're responsible for the first seven of the leader guides, and for week seven, you're responsible for the second seven. So that, that's essentially what we're doing. As I mentioned on the final exam, I'll ask you to explain the meaning of some of the passage covered in the 14 session guide, and then I'll ask you to explain how those passages fit into the Bible's overarching story. On the exam, to answer those questions, you need to explain which of the seven eras the passage is in and how it fits in with the other six eras. That doesn't mean you need to summarize every era for every question, but I want to know which era of biblical history this passage falls in and what comes before it and what comes after it and kind of how it fits in with what comes before and what comes after. I'm going to give you some examples of what I want you to do, so stay tuned for that. And then also on the final exam, I'm going to ask you to summarize the Bible's overall story in your own words. What I want you to do there is just give me a couple of sentences, three, four sentences for each era. Tell me what's going on in that era and tie all the eras together by telling me what the Bible is about, what the, what the big idea of the Bible is. To help you with that, I'm going to give you my own summary of the Bible's story. This is based on Bible Mesh, but it's not the Bible Mesh story, it's the Bible's story. In the beginning, God created everything there is in the universe. Genesis 1 and 2 tell us that. He made it perfect and harmonious and exactly as it ought to be. The Bible says that it was good. And then he put people in the Garden of Eden and he told them, you're going to flourish and you're going to enjoy friendship with me so long as you do not eat from one tree. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As you know, man and woman disobeyed in Genesis chapter 3. And God said, because of your disobedience, the perfect harmony of creation is ruined. The perfect harmony between man and woman is broken. You're going to have strife now in your human relationships. And because of your sin, the harmony between man and God is broken. You're not going to have the access to God or the intimate fellowship like you had before. But God made a promise in Genesis chapter 3 that set the story, the stage for the whole rest of the biblical story. I want to read it to you. It's Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. God said to the serpent who tempted Adam and Eve, who was Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. God said as early as Genesis chapter 3, here's the way that I'm going to fix the curse that sin brought on the world and that Satan brought into this world. There's going to be someone who is the offspring of a woman, and he is going to strike a fatal blow to the head of Satan and evil and end all of this curse that's come on the world. As soon as Genesis 3 happened, God's people started looking for this person. But the world just kept getting more sinful. And every time it looked like God was about to finally bring this person and finally reverse the curse of sin and make everything all right, then something else would happen. In Genesis chapter 6, the world got so evil that God destroyed it with a flood. And he saved Noah and Noah's family. And we get the impression that, okay, now one righteous man has been preserved, so God will finally use this righteous man and his family to undo the curse of sin and bring righteousness and harmony to this creation. But almost as soon as he gets off the ark, Noah sins. He gets drunk and passes out and disgraces himself. And his descendants continue to be evil until finally we get to the Tower of Babel when man is disobeying God's commandment in an egregious way again and God confuses the languages of mankind as a punishment because they're so evil and they're 
planning together as to how they can try to be as great as God. Well, in the midst of all that evil, then God chooses a man named Abraham. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you and your descendants, and through you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. In other words, God was saying, Abraham, I'm choosing you, and you and your family are going to be the people through whom I finally bring the solution to this sin problem in the world. Well, Abraham starts to have children. He has a son, Isaac, and he has a son, Jacob, and he has a son, Joseph. And we start to expect that this family of Abraham's is going to finally bring the harmony to creation that we're, we've longed for since Genesis 3. But then you get to the book of Exodus, and we find that the descendants of Abraham are slaves in Egypt. They're in bondage, and there's no hope of a people in bondage, saving the world and blessing all nations, delivering, delivering the world from the sin problem that came in at the beginning when Adam and Eve sinned, well, then in the Exodus, God miraculously delivers the nation of Egypt from Egyptian bondage. He brings them out and he gives them their own land. And we think now is the time where the nation of Israel is finally going to flourish and God's going to bring righteousness to all nations through his people. But that's not what we see. In the book of Judges, the sin gets so bad that if you were going to make a film out of Judges, it would be hard-pressed to get an R rating that the people become so bad. And then even when they get a king in the, in the promised land, they're still bad. Under David and Solomon, the nation flourishes, and you think, well, now things are getting really good. God's people are finally going to conquer sin and start to bring righteousness to all nations. But then Solomon starts to head south in his behavior, in his immorality. And after Solomon, the nation of Israel splits into two kingdoms, and the kings get progressively more wicked, though the kings in the south are a little better than the kings in the north. And eventually, this people, through whom God promised he would bless all nations and fix the sin problem, is taken into exile. And we get to another juncture in the Bible where we think, how can God possibly be fixing the problem of sin through these people? They're in exile in Babylon for the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was exiled and essentially wiped out by the Assyrians earlier, and we wonder, how can this people possibly solve the sin problem? But then he brings them back from exile, and through that process he promises that there's going to be a new covenant, that one day, even though this nation of Israel failed to follow God, that God's going to put his Holy Spirit within God's people, and he's going to give them the ability to obey and supernaturally make them an obedient people and a blessing to others. And he promises that a Messiah is going to come to inaugurate this new covenant and start to finally make things better. By the time that Jesus of Nazareth is born, expectations of this Messiah are at a fevered pitch. And Jesus begins to announce that he is the promised Messiah. Some believe in him. And when he dies on the cross, his death pays the penalty that all of his followers deserve for their sin. And his perfect life is counted as though it were his followers. We're counted as righteous, and Jesus is counted as having paid the penalty for our sin so that we have access to God. And when we follow Jesus, he puts his spirit within us and makes us start to obey and want to obey just as the prophet Jeremiah predicted when he prophesied the new covenant. Well, throughout Acts and the epistles, then we start to see what life as a follower of Jesus in the church looks like. Jesus does begin to set apart a people for himself that are separate from this world and are not behaving like the Israelites, but are behaving like a holy, righteous people. Uh, we see Christianity, Christianity expand so that after the resurrection of Jesus, Christian, Christianity was just a a few dozen people gathered together in an upper room in Jerusalem, but by the time the last New Testament books are written, Christianity had spread across the Roman Empire. And then by the time we reach the year 325 or thereabouts, Christianity became the dominant favored religion in the Roman Empire. And by the time we get to the year 2014, when I'm recording this lecture, 
then Christianity has spread to every nation across the world. It's as though the story that began in Genesis 3 is finally coming near to completion because the world was racked by sin and God promised that through His Son, He would start to create a people that obeyed and that wanted to follow Him and didn't fall away and that then became a blessing to all nations. But as you know, as you know very well, the problem of sin is not yet fixed. The church is an outpost of God's kingdom. We're a little pocket where things are more right than they are in the world. But even in our lives, sin still has more of a hold than we want it to have. And in this world, we see the effects of evil and sin everywhere. We see death. We see natural disasters. We see broken families. And we know that's not yet fixed. But God promises that at the end of time, Jesus will return. And when he returns, the good thing that is begun in the church, the fix of creation, the fix of the sin problem that Jesus started through his redeemed people is going to be totally completed. All sin will be wiped out. All sadness will be wiped out. And God's kingdom, his rule and his reign will be established forever on this earth. And then we will see the complete fulfillment of what God started in Genesis 1. He will finally have a perfect creation filled with people who walk in harmony with Him and harmony, harmony with each other without sin. Now, that's the long version of the Bible's story. But I hope that by listening to that and by watching Bible Mesh, you might be able to condense that story down so that you could just either write or speak a succinct expression of what the Bible is about. Now, finally, I want to take three passages that are in the 14-session leader guide from the first three eras and illustrate how you might uh, interpret a passage in light of Jesus. The first one is Genesis chapter 3. We already talked about this a little bit, but uh, one of the passages that you could be asked about on your exam is Genesis chapter 3. And the question you would be asked is something like, Explain how Genesis chapter 3 fits into the Bible's overall story. And what you would need to say is something like this. In Genesis 1 and 2, God created the world perfect. But Genesis 3 shows us how sin ruined the perfect creation. And it also shows us in Genesis 3.15 how God began a plan to fix and reverse the curse of sin. In the rest of the Old Testament, this promise gets fleshed out. As we first learned that the fix for sin will come through Abraham's family, and then we learn that it's going to come through the line of David, and then finally in the New Testament we learn that it's Jesus, and he begins the fix now, and then we, he's promising that he will come again to complete the fix. That's just briefly situating Genesis 3 in light of the whole Bible. And it gives us a much better idea of why Genesis 3 is important than if we merely apply the rules for interpreting historical narrative when we read Genesis chapter 3. Take Genesis chapter 15. That's another passage that uh, is listed in the 14 session leader guide. And you may be asked on the final exam, how does Genesis chapter 15 fit into the overall story of Scripture? Je let me read a little bit of Genesis chapter 15 because you're probably not as familiar with that as you are with Genesis uh, chapter 3. I'm gonna, I'll just read to you, starting in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to, came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abraham, and fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, of the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, 
How am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. And he did not cut, But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Well, I didn't really intend to read that whole chapter, but I got into it, and it just felt like we ought to continue. It's a wonderful passage. In Genesis chapter 12, God had first called Abram, and he'd made a promise to him that his descendants were going to bless all nations, that he and his descendants were going to be the, the fix to the curse of sin. So if you're asked to put Genesis chapter 15 uh, in light of all the scripture, you would need to note, in the beginning God created the world perfectly. It was marred because of sin. God announced his intention to fix the, the problem. And then it, he said he was going to fix it through Abram. And here in Genesis chapter 15, God makes a covenant with Abram where he tells Abram essentially, I promise you that I'm going to do everything that I said. And God cuts these animals in two, and he sets them as kind of a, like they're a bloody road. And, he, and the tradition was in the ancient Near East that when you made a covenant with somebody, the two people would cut animals in two, then walk between the animals. And it was a symbol with each person saying, if I don't abide by the stipulations of this covenant... May the fate of these animals be my fate. May I be ripped in two if I don't keep this covenant. The interesting thing about Genesis 15 is that God divides the animals and makes a covenant with Abram, but then the, the torch and the pot walk through. That's God walking through symbolically, but he never makes Abram walk. Only God walks through. And God's making an unconditional covenant with Abram, saying, Abram, I promise you that I am going to do everything I say. I'm going to bless all nations through your offspring. I'm going to fix the problem of sin through your offspring. And if I don't do that, may the fate of these animals be my fate. Abram doesn't have to do anything. He just receives an unconditional promise from God. So after you note that God created the world perfect, that it was marred because of sin, and God chose Abram to be the father of the nation that would fix it, then you just note that in Genesis chapter 15, God confirmed his covenant with Abraham and promised that he would unconditionally bring it about. Then you see through uh, the rest of Israel's history that God began to do that when he, when he brought Israel into the promised land. And then he finally and fully uh, brought the solution to the world's problems through a descendant of Abraham named Jesus. And then in the New Testament, we see the beginning of that fix. And at Jesus' second coming, then we see the final fix to the problem of sin. But Genesis 15 is important because it was the point at which God promised unconditionally that he was going to carry out that plan through Abram's descendants. Nothing that they did was going to derail the plan because God would fix the sin problem. Well, one more passage that I'll mention. Well, let me say this. Uh, I just saw a note that I made that I think might be helpful. Because without the fall in Genesis chapter 3, the choice of Abraham wouldn't have been necessary because there would have been no sin problem to fix. And then the choice of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 eventually led to Jesus coming to save the world um, through God's people. 
So it connects with what came before and it connects with what came afterward. You just have to state that briefly if you're asked about this or any other passage on the final exam. Well, that brings us back to the Ten Commandments. One of the passages that's mentioned for Era 3 in the 14 session guide is Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 through 21, and it includes a little bit of Genesis, I mean, uh, Exodus 19. And you might be asked on the final exam, how do the Ten Commandments fit into the overall story of Scripture? Well, you would note the creation, the fall, God's promise to fix sin through a descendant of woman, and then God's cho choice of Abraham and his descendants to be the people through whom that fix would come. When we get to the era of Moses, the era of Exodus, God had built the nation of Israel and chosen them to be his covenant people who would bring blessing to the whole world. And the Ten Commandments are the rules God gives his people so that they can live in fellowship with him. Uh, and then as you go through the rest of the eras, you see how God's people interact with the Ten Commandments. In era four, Israel disobeys the commandments over and over. And then in era five, they're exiled from the promised land for disobeying the commandments. Finally, in era six, Jesus obeys the commandments perfectly and inaugurates the new covenant. And then in era seven, the church era, Jesus' perfect obedience counts for his people. It's imputed to them so that God regards the people who follow Jesus is perfectly righteous and gives them access to him. And then God also empowers the followers of Jesus to keep those commandments in a better way than anyone before had. So the Ten Commandments really carry through all the eras of Scripture and, and tie them together. You need to note the creation, the fall, and how the Ten Commandments play a role in God's continued fix of the problem of sin. This should begin to give you an idea of how the Bible ties together and how you need to situate any passage you study in light of God's big plan. Don't worry if it's not completely clear to you yet, because through the biblical story and through next week's lecture and through our interaction on the discussion forums, you should start to get more of a handle on this. I just hope and pray that the Bible for you will never be a collection of scattered texts and passages that don't tie together. But whether you're reading the Psalms or whether you're reading Leviticus or whether you're reading Ephesians, I want you to know that it's all part of a story that centers on Jesus. This is really the kind of Bible study that I think Jesus himself did in Luke chapter 24. Um, mere mentioning of a, a passage's meaning without knowing the big context and what it has to do with Jesus isn't enough. But I think that probably is enough for this week's lecture, and we'll talk about it more next week.